The Economic Crisis, explained by Dr. Hansen's Summer Enrichment Course at Menlo School, 2009. If at any point of this video you don't understand a term, just pause it, look it up in Wikipedia. The core of our problem starts with America's twin deficits. A trade deficit and a budget deficit. When Americans drive home from Toys R Us with foreign goods, they are importing toys and sending off their dollars overseas. What happens is that America is importing a lot more than they are exporting, leaving foreign countries with a great deal of US dollars and America with a big trade deficit. We also have a big budget deficit. Americans want greater services from the government but don't want their benefits cut and don't want their taxes raised. As a result, the government is spending a lot more than it's bringing in. So you've got two deficits. You're importing a lot more than you're exporting and you're spending a lot more than you're bringing in. And what that leads to is a phenomenon called hot money. Since all these foreign countries have a lot of US dollars, they want to do something with them. And that big pool of money uh, generated by the two deficits is going to have to find a place to be invested. At the time, the United States was a, was a good place to invest in. There were high interest rates. And specifically, there was this wonderful uh, asset bubble in the United States within the housing market. The house prices were consistently rising and so it seemed like a great investment, a great place to put your money. And so all these foreign countries with all these US dollars that they had gotten from selling all these goods to the United States um, and investors in general were investing a lot of their money in, in the US housing market um, directly and, and through uh, mortgage-backed securities and other uh, financial means. At the same time, there was a permissive environment, uh, you know, in the banking industry. There was an anti-regulatory streak, and the general feeling was that markets know best and were self-regulating, and therefore, if banks and the financial industry was allowed to fend for itself and make decisions for itself without government intervention, that things would self-regulate and we would there would never be uh, room for a total collapse because the markets know best and the markets are not going to can't go that wrong they will always self-regulate and correct at the same time there were all these innovations so there was what are called financial you know derivative training and mortgage-backed securities so people were buying these securities which were backed by mortgages that were based on the concept that were only viable if house prices kept on rising. And so most people thought that house prices in the United States would keep on rising and so all these investors bought these mortgage-backed securities and then house prices didn't continue to rise and the risk of that was not properly taken into account by banks because they were not regulated and they figured that if things were to go horribly wrong then they would get bailed out like the so, uh, savings and loans banks did in 1989. And so there was called what's called a moral hazard, meaning that the risk was not properly priced. They took a lot of risk in these mortgage-backed securities because they figured house prices would go up, and they figured that in the off chance if they didn't, it wasn't that big of a deal because the government would step in to help them. Now taking a closer look at the U.S. housing bubble, as all bubbles do, it eventually burst. And there was a correction in house prices downwards and for the first time in the history there was a strong sustained decrease in house prices that had never been seen before and be partially because this has never happened before the financial models um, that you know bankers constructed did not properly take into account the possibility 
that housing prices would drop. And so things like a mortgage-backed security, which relies on people paying their mortgages and on house prices rising, were regarded as not being very risky investments because house prices were rising and it seemed like a good idea. But when house prices fall as dramatically as they did for the first time in history, suddenly all these investments are revealed to be a lot riskier and a lot more dangerous than people thought they were. As the bubble burst, of course, people stopped paying their mortgages. So that's an income, you know, revenue stream for all those who bought mortgage-backed securities that, that goes down because the money isn't flowing in anymore. And house prices drop. So even if a bank, you know, takes your house because you stopped paying your mortgage, they can't sell it back and recoup their loss because your house isn't worth much anymore. And so the banks took a huge loss in this, and so did anyone who was investing in mortgage-backed securities. Now this had profound impacts in, in two sectors, you know, the financial sector and the real economy. Taking a closer look at the financial sector, um, there was what's called a credit crunch, meaning that there was no available credit to invest because as there was a widespread panic, people tried to sell their investments and uh, escape the housing mortgage-backed security market. Most of these investments were done by what are called banks and especially quasi-banks and the big important thing to realize is that quasi-banks are not regulated. These are people like uh, AIG and others who were investing and, and making investments but were not regulated by the government and were not properly taking into account the risk, you know, what would happen if house prices didn't rise. That, that was not taken into account by, by these banks and quasi-banks and their balance sheets exploded. Suddenly, what no one wanted to buy mortgage-backed securities. And so on your balance sheet, you know, you have to report the fair value of what you own. And if no one wants to buy what you own, you know, your mortgage-backed securities, then maybe they're worth zero. And so all of a sudden, the, you know, when you, the bank is reporting what's on their you know, balance sheet, they have all these assets, these mortgage-backed securities that no one wants to buy, and so they're forced to report them as having very little or no value, and then their overall balance sheet goes negative. And so people freak out, because your your bank and your quasi-bank now is is going negative. They have things that are worth zero in, in their asset side of the balance sheet, and they have a bunch of liabilities, and uh, you know, very famous and prominent example of this was Lehman Brothers, a hedge fund that that went under because it its total worth just went negative. And this causes a panic, because now no one wants to own a mortgage-backed security, even a safe one, because you're thinking, well, the next guy's mortgage-backed security you know, went under and, and stopped making money. Maybe mine will as well. And so everyone wants to sell them. No one wants to buy them. They become virtually worthless, and the banks collapse, and the quasi-banks collapse as well. This leads to a panic, and we're going to see another way that panic was generated. In the, in the rest of the economy. As house prices went down, house building went down, um, and that led to an increase in unemployment there. An increase in unemployment because of a general decrease in wealth generated both by the drop in housing prices, the immediate effects of that, and the indirect effect of a drop in housing prices, you know, the fact that mortgage-backed securities were not worth anything anymore and banks had collapsed and people's savings vaporized, that combined with unemployment meant that people, the consumer confidence went way down. And when you see people, you know, your neighbor losing his job, and you're not sure whether you're going to lose yours tomorrow, and you see your neighbor's life savings vaporize because he invested in Lehman Brothers and they don't exist anymore, you are not going to go out and make investments. You are not going to go out and buy a new car. You're not going to go out and buy a new HGTV. You're going to save. You're going to try, you're not going to trust the, the, you know, your investments. You're going to try to get your money out of your investments. You're going to sell your stocks. You're going to try to sell everything you've got. And so stock prices go way down. Dow drops from 14,000. Now it's about 8,000, almost halves. Um, car sales go way down. And that's how you get these, you know, that, that you see it in the news. You have GM going bankrupt and needing great government intervention. That's how that happened. Because house prices go down, 
banks collapse, people lose their life savings, and people become extremely worried about their financial future, and so they stop buying new things. Now, when car sales go down, there's also a rise in unemployment, and so there's this vicious cycle. As people stop spending, people stop getting new jobs. You know, as, as you buy less Starbucks in the morning, there's going to be less Starbucks opening. In fact, Starbucks closing. Starbucks people are going to lose their jobs. The people who lost their jobs who are no longer working at Starbucks no longer have as much money to spend, so they're not going to buy as many cars. And the people who lost their jobs because they're no longer making cars don't have as much money to spend, so they're not going to buy HDTVs. And then the people who used to be making HDTVs but lost their jobs aren't going to have as much, need, as much money to spend. And so there's this vicious cycle that has uh, spurred the recession. And at the same time, you've got people's savings going uh, vaporizing. So people just want to save, which is why the tax cuts that came under the Bush administration weren't particularly effective because they didn't go to simulating the economy. People took their tax cut checks and just saved them instead of spending them. And when people save, it's, it's good for the individual, but it doesn't help the overall economy recover. And car sales did not go up. Um, you know, house housing sales did not go up, housing prices did not go up, investment did not go up, people just saved that money because people were very worried. And this is a problem for any government stimulus policy. You're going to want to figure out how you can effectively use government stimulus money to stimulate the economy in a way that will guarantee that your money is going to be working and not just going to people's savings accounts. This this is how you can see different philosophies. Are you going to give people tax cuts and then just have them save them, or are you going to directly spend on a government project, say renovate a highway, and that way guarantee that that money is being spent on new tractors, new services, and, and hiring new people? The other issue that arises is as different theories and policies and philosophies on how to solve this problem emerge, there can be the issue that people spend a lot of time trying to figure out who is to blame, how to solve the problem, what to do, and they therefore never actually get around, getting, get around to implementing a solution. Um, and so the open-ended question that we're left with is, who's to blame, how are we going to fix this problem? And what are we going to do? And most importantly, if we spend too much time arguing about this, are we ever going to get around to implementing a solution? And to go back to the beginning and give it a, a view on how this all started, going back to the permissive environment that that led to all of this, what really spurred it all was a general government policy and an idea that home ownership was a good thing. And that it was very it was an important policy goal to have a high level of home ownership in the United States. And therefore Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, two institutions, uh, greatly expanded mortgage lending in, in risky areas as everyone has heard, and it's a subprime mortgage. And as they did, other banks followed. And as other banks followed, and everyone was lending into, into subprime mortgages that created a lot, much more volatile situation that only, strictly depended on the rise of house prices to remain viable. And so because house prices did not rise and because there was so much lending into subprime areas that were directly dependent on that factor that greatly accelerated the demise of the financial system um, because of all the, the risk that was taken. And so therefore it's not just the federal government, it's not just Congress, but both are in charge of fixing the mess because in, the, in some ways they are both responsible. They have created the twin deficits and they created a housing policy that encouraged lending into very, very risky areas to boost the homeownership count in the United States and that created a bad combo. And now the real question is what to do.